Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Inside Music. As always, I'm your host, James Shotwell, and I could not be more excited to share today's episode with you. My guest is the great Brian McTurnan, who's probably best known as a producer responsible for some of the biggest albums the alternative scene has ever known. The early Circus Survive albums, that comes from Brian. Texas is the Reason's early work, that comes from Brian. The recent Sharp Tooth album, which I cannot stop listening to, Brian worked on that as well. He's a producer who's single-handedly played a role in shaping the modern alternative space, and now he's about to release an album of his own. Brian's band Be Well will release their new album, The Weight and the Cost, through Equal Vision Records this month, and he's going to tell us all about it on the show today. But before we get there, we need to cover a few quick things. First and foremost, this episode of Inside Music is brought to you by Holix, the music industry's leading promotional distribution platform. Now what that means is that record labels, publicists, and independent artists from all corners of the earth use Holix to share their new and upcoming releases with members of the media through their secure platform. Bands like Slipknot, Tool, Killswitch Engage, Blink-182, and thousands more trust Holix, and you should too. So visit holix.com today, that's H-A-U-L-I-X.com today to sign up. I also want to recommend that you check out our other show. It's called High Notes. And it's a podcast about addiction and recovery in the music industry. The entire first season is available now, and we'd love for you to check it out. But all you really need to do, at least right this second, is sit back, relax, and enjoy my interview with Brian McTiernan. There's not like as much big press opportunities, <laughs> and um, but I like it because I, the podcast format is like way more comfortable for me. Like it's like in more interactive, and you're able to kind of like go in different directions on the fly, which I like. Anyway, <clears throat> no, it's good. I think that's a good place to start. I mean, I'm I'm kind of obsessed with the current alternative news space you know as somebody who's also had something to promote recently it's it's kind of wild trying to figure out like what if anything matters in terms of talking to people right (laughs) right i mean i think the the cool thing about the podcast thing is like you know the there's like everybody's got kind of their own own spin on what what they're doing so i actually feel like there's more opportunity to really get, especially with like a someone like me or a band like Be Well, where there's like, you may want to talk to me about like recording Texas as a reason. <laughs> and you may want to talk to me about battery or you may want to just talk to me about Be Well or whatever it is. Like it, it can kind of go in a whole lot of different directions. And then you don't have to like crunch all that down into a couple pull quotes. So it's, I feel like, an opportunity for people to like, um, you know, tell their story in a, in a way that I, I don't think really existed so much before. And it's, I'll tell you what, it's about a million times better than, um, email interview questions. (laughs) Yeah, I can, I can definitely agree with that. I've been, uh, struggling a little bit because I, I do these interviews for podcasts that, you know, thankfully I'm, you know, I'm always excited. Somebody wants to talk to me about my thing, but you know, 45 to 65 minutes into the conversation, I find myself being like, how many people are going to see, like, listen to this or hear this or like, it's fun. Like I like having just the conversation, but you know, you can only fit, there's only so many times that you can like yeah. do the, 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 uh, the, sh- you know, the strut your stuff and like sell your thing. And like halfway through, I'm like, it's like, did they need 90 minutes of my time or could we have done this in 35 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it's good. It's good. I mean, and here you are talking to me again, letting me eat up your time twice. So you know, there you go. <laughs> yes. Oh, no, it was a it was a pleasure. I'm excited to get to do it again. No, it's fine. It's fine. We're already we're already in the thick of it. And I saw that you you uh, followed our our little show high notes on the side on Twitter. So I appreciate that. Appreciate your silent support. It's good. It's useful. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, but seriously, I, it was something we we've been working on season two for that, and I remember you uh, offering to let me speak with your wife on that matter. Um, and I, I think we're going to take you up on that at another point in the future because it, it, that is something we wanted to come up with. You know, being able to work with Anthony and, and even he he noticed that you had followed the account and he texted me about it, and I was just like, look, my whole my whole world right here coming together. <laughs> I love that. Well, the cool thing is, Minu, um, my wife loves Anthony too. So I think, and she's, she, I think she she'll be a really interesting person to talk to, just because like her, you know, there is so much like judgment of like um, people with mental health issues and you know addiction issues and substance abuse things, and like she's the probably the least judgmental person you'll ever talk about, and it's like. I love she'll like simplify something to like, you know, hey, if you had a broken arm, <laughs> nobody would be blaming you for that. You know, kind of like <laughs> like really has like a really interesting way of like make, you know, giving you some perspective on your, you know, preconceived notions about life choices people have made. Um, so. Mm -hmm. I would. I think that would be a super interesting episode. Well, I'm into it. But let's talk about Be Well because something I, I thought about after I talked to you last time, I don't think we covered, was I know how busy you are. I know how many records you've been doing for other people lately. So I was curious, like, how long did making this album take? I mean, not let's not let's not include like actual. Let's just do actual production of the album because I know writing is like you, you get a lot longer to write things than actually record them but in your case because you make your own music you make you can record your own stuff how long was the actual production period because i imagine it was like spliced between other things uh, <laughs> well the crazy thing about the record that you might not know is that we actually recorded the record twice so we, before we had like member members um when we were really struggling to find people to play with which is so kind of always blows everybody's mind because you kind of think like you know, like everybody I know in the world is like a musician, but but finding people that are kind of like of a like mind and kind of similar playing abilities and kind of who are, you, you know, like kind of want to do a band and want to do a band where nobody cares yet. And <laughs> it's it's harder than you think think it would be. So initially, Mike Schleibaum, the guitar player, and I had been working on these songs and we didn't have members and we, we thought, you know, we'll just go ahead and make the record. And so we hired a studio drummer and um, he was actually the drummer from Darkest Hour and he's he played on the Sharp Tooth record too that we talked about last time and he's fucking, he's an unbelievable drummer and he came in and he killed it and he did everything exactly right, <laughs> but almost too exactly right in a sense, like you know, it, it like a, a punk hardcore record to me, there's got to be um, like a certain level of imperfection and swing to it. Like if it's if 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 you know, I don't really like a lot of like super gridded, like overly processed stuff to begin with. But like you take a fast hardcore song and you have it sound like a machine played it it's just not very cool <laughs> and and um we, we, we tracked the whole record so the the drumming was like too perfect and then when i went to track the vocals i was so worried about like running the operation of like you know do a bit and listen back do a bit and listen back that like even my, my vocals were just not emotional and didn't have the feeling that that i was hoping for and then you know like Originally, Mike and I played all the guitars and like we're both pretty experienced guitar players. So it's hard to be like, I'm just going to let this fly and I'm not going to worry if there's like mistakes and scratches and a bent note and things like that. Like, And so the guitars were kind of too perfect. And then the whole thing, the cumulative fa factor ended up being that the record just didn't have the kind of like feeling and like... I don't want to say vulnerability that, that, that it kind of needed, but like there just wasn't life to it in like the record so personal and emotional that it like just never sat quite right with me. And, um, and then, um, and then we were sending it to, to people and people were kind of like, I, you know, I like, 
I like this, but I don't play like that. Like, especially with the drums, because it, the guy is like so fucking good and like playing all this crazy shit that I think people couldn't imagine themselves doing it. So actually, um, last summer I I used to sing in a I used to sing in a band called Battery, and we were about to go to Europe to do a tour with H2O and the drummer that was playing on that tour, I just said to him, hey, dude, this shit is not feeling good to me. Like, is there any way you could, like, come to the studio and we could, like, record a couple of these songs and, like, I can, like, confirm for myself if I'm being a psycho or not. And he came in and tracked, like, six or seven of the songs on the record and fucking killed it. And it was like, oh, my God, that's what it's supposed to be like. So we actually scrapped the record totally and totally started over. We kept his drum tracks that he had done because on a handful of them because he had done such a good job. And then once we started sending that stuff to people, then people were like, oh, shit, this is fucking rad. And all of a sudden, like, our drummer Shane heard it and, like, he plays so much like Andrew. They have a very similar style. He totally got it, joined the band, played the shit perfect and then we recorded a whole bunch of more songs with with him involved and that's kind of what became the record so the whole thing probably I mean it was spread out over like almost a year just because of all this starts and stops and um I had to kind of like you know like I had to figure out a bunch of things like with the vocals like I had to really like I'm recording myself and I had to distance myself from like being the producer and the engineer. And I had to figure out like, you know what? I need to go and sing this shit. And I need to do like five or six takes where I just like pour my heart out and I don't worry about it. Like I don't stop and listen back. And so I started tracking kind of batches of takes over all the songs and I didn't go and like put them all together yet. I just like got it all out of me. And then I went, figured out like if I do that and then I put that together and then I punch a thing or two that I feel like I could still hit better then then I can get the emotion that the songs need to have and we've kind of finally figured it out and over the course of about a year and three months the took to make the record which is fucking insane (laughs) (laughs) no I like that that's but you know (laughs) but the 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 thing is like you have to keep in mind like I I um I hadn't made I hadn't made a record of my own material in 20 years and even before that I never like I was in Ashes and Battery and Milltown and like Ashes you know every time we recorded it was like a day you know we'd like go to the studio record the whole shit live do a second guitar track sing and be done and then the Battery records were made in a similarly kind of haphazard way which i think does add to the charm of it but for me to become a producer like i did and make all of these records like i had never been had the opportunity to like make something of my own in the same way that i helped other bands make records so it was so it was so fun and i also felt like the world wasn't waiting for this record unless it was really special. So why fucking stick with something that I didn't believe in? Like it's hard <laughs> if I, if I don't feel good about it, it's hard to ask other people to like pour their hearts into it as well. So that's what we did. And it was one of this, you know, it was a very scary decision. And like everybody around me was like, dude, you're insane. You're being crazy. Like, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> At a certain point after doing this for a certain amount of time, you have to kind of trust your gut. And um, and I'm glad I did because I, I'm really happy with the feeling of the record now. Like it it feels the way that I had imagined it in the first place. And, you know, it just took some sorting out, which I've been involved with a lot of records that go through, have ebbs and flows. And you think you got it and then you realize you don't and you have to go back and, and rework things. And a lot of times with records, like the best shit is like the last stuff that comes out of it. And and w- the nice thing was when we went and started writing the last batch of songs for the record with Shane and the, the band then involved, it was like those songs are so different than the rest of the things that really kind of all balanced the record out in a nice way and just kind of worked out the way it feels like it should have. 
I mean, I love it. I, I feel like you can sense the it, – it's really difficult to convey – like organized chaos or like we know what we're doing, but it still feels loose and you managed to capture it. But I guess that's a credit to, you know, all the things that you've done in your life. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you know, the part, part of the, the, the one of the most important roles as a producer is to know what the record is meant to feel like, like, it's like, it's funny because people, I mean, I think people listen to records and they think, oh, the producer's job is like, you know, the drum sound or the this or the that. And really like, you're kind of like, you're, you're in charge of the color and the feeling of the record. And then, and, and all of that other stuff kind of goes into that, you know, the sounds and the performances and the songs, but like, it took me a minute like, you know, in producing my own record to one kind of be able to zoom back out and be like, wait, hold on. We put all this time in and it isn't what what it what it's meant to be. And then also like kind of coming back around to it and and then being like, OK, now we're where we need to be. And it's like it was a lot more stressful to do that with my own stuff because you get I mean, you know, this with all of the things you're working on like you get so close to it and it's really hard to like make those decisions and then if you haven't you know to the outside world like I'm sending stuff to people and it sounded in some ways more perfect definitely more perfect than the record sounds now so I got a lot of like dude you're being a fucking maniac like this is fine <laughs> but at a certain point, you have to trust yourself when like fine isn't enough, you know, and and like I've had to help other bands make those decisions enough times that I like once I was able to kind of pull back and be honest with myself, you know, it it, it was the right decision. Absolutely. I'm glad that you were able to figure figure that out. You know, I was thinking about battery this morning when I was getting ready for this. I was thinking about how strange it is that a uh, that one band can produce two guys that get so into production that they then are responsible for like a generation's worth of albums in the alternative music scene. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it's one of those yeah. things that like, I know you couldn't plan, but in hindsight, it's just like, wow, if you and Matt hadn't started a band, you know, 30 years ago, we might not have so many records that people are now like, that's my favorite album of all time. Even if they've never heard battery. Yeah. Well, the thing, the thing that I like, the thing that was really cool about is really cool about my relationship with Matt and just so many, so many of the people that like I've had in my life is that, I mean, yeah, well, I think about like me as a skateboarder, right? Like when I was young, I skated and all my friends were like, not that good. And so, so the, I kind of got as good as they got and thought I was okay until one day I saw people that were like really good. And then I'm like, wow, I'm so far away from that. Like I give up. And I just lucked out um, when I was like young and getting into music that like one, you know, Matt Squire and I started playing together and he was like a virtuoso musician from like eighth grade when I met him like he he was like this like Steve Vai kind of dude and the other thing that was interesting is he liked um like punk and hardcore you know but he also really loved like pop you know like Prince and C I mean I, I remember like we would be driving to shows and like I'd be putting on like quicksand and he'd be driving and he'd put on like seal <laughs> you know what I mean so it's pretty it was like it was like, he was so good. I was good. We both pushed each other. I kept raising the bar. And then the other thing that I was really lucky is um, Ken Olden, who was a guitar player and battery, uh, who went on to be, um, he's a producer. He went on to be in Damnation. He is like a brilliant songwriter and guitar player. And he he was several years older than me. And I just feel like the two of them kind of like were so good and so creative that like kind of like what I thought was possible from very early on in my life was like anything's possible. Like, like what I, what I was looking to hear out of my own music was so 
much more evolved than typically would be for like a 15 year old (laughs) because I was surrounded by these people that were so good. And unlike my skating where I kind of realized one day, like we all suck, fuck it. You know, like I was actually in the mix with still to this day. I mean, I've been around a lot of musicians, like two of the best songwriters and best musicians I've ever encountered. And that was from like day one of my musical career. So it, you know, it doesn't, it, you know, I I never anticipated having the kind of success that I ended up having and I'm super grateful for it. And Matt being as successful and Ken being as successful as they are just doesn't surprise me even a little bit because they're really, really gifted. And I feel like all of us kind of pushed each other to become great you know and i'm i'm thankful for that well i hope that we get the battery documentary or at least limited podcast series that tells us that whole story in full <laughs> one day i feel like it's an essential part of capturing how we get to where we are as an alternative community yeah <laughs> <laughs> i know it's something you could never predict and that's that's kind of the beauty of it it's like the yeah. magic of it all like little did they know <laughs> well the funny the thing the th- thing for me that is um that is like so awesome and is that like that shit that we did when we were like kids you know like we first battery demo was 1990 i was in eighth grade like people still care about it and it's like i I would always say this to bands when they were in the studio but like the shit we're doing really does matter and and like you know like bands would come into the studio and just be like you know, writing like half-assing lyrics and half-assing performances and the songs aren't written. And, you know, like the shit is like, they don't have their shit together at all. And I think all the time, like you understand that if you get it right, it lasts forever and people will care forever because it's so fucking obvious when something is great and something connects. And like, you know, you're like, I think that like in this world of like, streaming and like you record a song and it's out two weeks later. Like I think sometimes people lose sight that like there are very few things you get to do with your life that nobody can ever take away. And making records is one of them. And like, it's a gift and it's an honor. And like, I always, I, I like, I've been around so many just absolutely inspiring people. And then I've also been around so many situations where people just don't get how important it is, you know, and people don't get that um, all of the little things matter. It's funny, actually, because Matthew Gordner is like a heading up the be well um, side of things at Equal Vision always says, and I love it. He says, it's not a dollar, it's a hundred pennies, right? And like, that really is what art is. That's what like, your podcast stuff is and making records is and writing songs is and you know all of it all of the little things the sum total of all of it end up being something big and like we're all lucky to be able to be doing this and it always made me sad when people wouldn't realize the gravity of that like you know you're going to have these records and people are going to want to talk about them 30 years from now what do you want to say when you talk about it oh i was on my you know Instagram in between vocal takes and didn't give a shit. And you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I, I just feel like people don't, people are going to regret, you know, that I worry that there are bands that the records, they don't realize how important they are and how long that they'll live. And um, it's funny actually, because we were talking about Anthony Green, but I had someone in the studio and all they could talk to me about was circus survive, circus survive, circus survive. (laughs) And then, you know, we're, we're working on the vocals and it's like, like dudes, like, you know, great singer, great guy, but like checking emails, like going Instagram live between takes and, you know, texting people and, you know, like Anthony Green isn't Anthony Green just because he has this like awesome voice. He's fucking Anthony Green because he cares so fucking much. And when he's in the studio, He's in the studio and he's making art and he's pouring every ounce of himself into it. And he's not worrying about all of this other bullshit. And that's why people like that 
are so special and so important and so inspiring to me. Absolutely. Right before you and I hopped on the phone, a friend texted me that Deftones had updated their website. It looks like at the end of September, we're finally going to get new material, but they're a band that I think of that same way where it's like, they're never not working on something. It just takes, they just put so much into it that it takes us years to hear new stuff. Right. <laughs> right. That's the beauty yeah. of it. Well, I, you know, I want to ask you this cause you know, I definitely used a lot of your time to talk about other things and hopefully people are still enjoying our conversation here, but you know, I'm listening to, um, I'm listening to the record the other day and I was thinking to myself that I know how much you are proud of the record and how happy you are with how it came out and that you're not a guy who's like, this album is going to come out and it's going to change my life and the life of everybody in the band forever. And it'll be the only thing that we do or talk about moving forward. That's not how you look at releasing music. That's not the goals that you set for yourself. So I'm curious for you, like, what goals do you have for this record? Like, where where do you want it to go? What do you want it to become? Or how do you want it to be received? Like, what makes it a success in your book? Um, I mean, to me, it's already a success in my book because people like, you know, the out the outpouring of, like, support and, like, has just been insane. And honestly, like, we set out to do this because... One, we all missed playing music. Two, um, two, sorry, my daughter just walked. <laughs> two, we, like I personally like had a lot that like I had not kind of expressed in a, in a very long time. And, um, and three, like we just wanted an opportunity to play and have things to like pour ourselves into and like, all of those things have already happened. Like, I feel like in, in so many ways that we're kind of in like bonus time for me in terms of like what my goals were. Like, I honestly was like, I remember like we're, we're flying, flying home from this battery tour in Europe. And I just said to Mike Schleibaum, the guitar player from Be Well, like, I just want to be able to play small shows and have our friends come and like, <laughs> like, and just have a vehicle to continue to be connected to like this community and i feel like all all of those goals have been met and the thing that's totally exciting is i never anticipated people caring about it the way that they did i never anticipated like so many people wanting to talk to me the way that we're talking now i never anticipated the reviews coming back i mean i literally i mean so much of kind of like what I put out there lyrically on this record are the things that I kind of feared sharing with people more than anything in the world. And, um, you know, and none of it's like big, scary, crazy shit. It's just like, you know, the reality is like I've lived my life not feeling very good. And most people that know me don't know that about me. And so for me to kind of put that out there in the world, totally be prepared for people to be like, sorry, dude, <laughs> you know, like you're not the person I thought you were. I, I, it's been the total opposite where like, you know, I feared that like the bands that I worked with would feel like, you know, I didn't have my shit together and couldn't be responsible for, you know, being in charge of their record or that people would feel like, holy shit, this person, you know, like, I, the, the host of things that I, I had <laughs> had in my mind that people might think it's been the exact opposite. I mean, I've gotten so many like texts and emails and messages from people that are just like, dude, one, we love you Two, Of course we knew that you were struggling and I'm so happy that we can finally talk about it. And three, so many people that have found aspects of the music that they're able to relate to. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I feel like the, it's actually funny because I, I think that you know, a lot of people sing about the shit that I'm singing about on the record. You know what I mean? People sing about depression, people sing about like pain and heartbreak and disappointment and regret, all of those things. I think the one thing that is slightly different um, about this record than others is that I do think it's a much more personal approach. And transparent approach than sometimes people take and two there's a specificity about the actual 
things that I'm singing about that sometimes people don't um, don't d- don't don't do in rock. And actually, I was listening to um, this um, Malcolm Gladwell podcast where they 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 were talking about like pop sad songs and like country sad songs and like how different they are like a a a rock song or a pop song has got this like um this like you know it's it's like drenched in metaphors and 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 like dist it's like got a distance between the, the the feeling and the words in some ways where like country like and and country lyrics are have like this specificity about what the actual pain is and i feel like in some ways although the be well record is the furthest thing from a country record i do think that like lyrically there's a little bit of that approach and i think that it has been notable to people that it's slightly different than what they're used to hearing I love that answer, man. I think that there's a learning, there's like a moment of education in there for people to like what what to expect. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like all of your experience in the music industry has led to something everyone can learn from. Who would have guessed? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I thank you for taking time to talk to me today. The Be Well record is out soon and it's really good. And Brian has talked to me about it twice now because he's such a good guy. So make sure that you support him (laughs) and uh, all the things that he's doing. He's probably made one of your favorite records or a record that you've at least had to hear a bunch of times because it's your friend's favorite records. And now he's made one himself that you will love just as much or at least talk about as much because it's that good. I like to think of the Be Well record as an album for people who grew up listening to a certain kind of music that doesn't feel like they can relate to that genre of music that often anymore because their life is about different things now. Like whenever I get together with all of my friends that were in hardcore bands in the early 2000s, we don't talk about, you know, uh, bad relationships. We talk about being a parent or whether or not we can afford health insurance and <laughs> things along those lines. Right. And this is an album for people who might be able right. to relate to that as much as they still are forever that youthful hardcore kid. Right. Well, thank you.